Hello everyone, welcome to Prexel ADS. This is third GDM for the winter term, and I see all the wonderful faces. Uh, so if you haven't joined the Slack channel, please join it. That's where our main communication happens. Please follow us on Instagram. And this week, uh, we might have done introductions, but we are already running late, so we'll skip that to the end. But this week, we have Ansh Chandani as our speaker, and his talk is going to be about software security. For the background, Ansh is a good friend, and Ansh has interned at companies like just Planet International, Google, and Google in the past, and he is majoring in cyber security with a minor in computer science, so his interests lie in the area of which combines cybersecurity and computer science with applications in the AI and stuff. And in this talk, he's going to give a brief background about how software security works, what are the jobs in the field, and what are some fun things you can do with it. So let's welcome Munch. Uh, okay. So, hey everyone. Um, Today we're going to delve into the world of software security, which essentially covers uh, some of the cybersecurity related aspects to computer science and software engineering. Um, as a brief introduction, which we may cover most of, um, I'm, I'm the Vice President of Prexel Cybersecurity and a junior at Prexel. I study both cybersecurity and computer science at CCI, and uh, I've had a few introductions in the past. So, what, what is software security? Essentially, it's the idea of uh, practicing software engineering methodologies or building systems, um, keeping in mind certain, uh, certain fundamental cybersecurity uh, rules, so to speak. So, in cybersecurity, we have a saying uh, called the CIA trial, and this CIA trial basically means confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the idea behind software security is to build secure systems that have uh, these facets of confidentiality, integrity, and availability built into them. And this sort of involves understanding foundational system concepts and a little bit of operating system internals as well. And I'll get that later. But first, um, why should you even care about software security? Um, sounds like a pretty niche thing. Essentially, software security is um, software security becomes crucial if you if you want to design and build software that can't be hacked, and presumably all of you want to do so. It's recently a highly sought out trait by employers, including big tech employers like Facebook, Google, and so on. And it also opens a whole new class of jobs. So you you're not necessarily restricting yourself towards software engineering, full stack web development. You can also apply for other jobs, which we we'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, so before I bore you with technical details, um, let's let's look at let's look at a small case study. Essentially, the, the PHP language, which hopefully right now is an archaic backend language, but still used somewhere. Um, the PHP language has a function called shell Excel. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to execute bash or shell commands uh, within your PHP script. Something, something similar to how Python lets you make OS dot system calls to execute shell commands. So picture, picture a scenario like this. You have a web application that allows users to upload any PHP file they want. Um, it doesn't validate the content of that PHP file. And that PHP file is publicly reachable uh, by anyone who uploads it. Recipe for disaster, right? And this can this can be seen in a popular web application uh, that kind of dominated the internet um, a few years ago, and it was called the Gym Management System. Uh, the Gym Management System was a project uh, that had boilerplate PHP code and just allow someone to build a web application uh, representing a gym very quickly. And within, within the source code that was publicly available, um, there was a file called upload.php. Let's try and increase the point here. Yeah. So 
upload web literally basically uh, manage all the files that were uploaded to this particular um, this particular web server. And as you can see, it has it has some basic security measures like allowed extensions. It uh, validates your it validates your file extension, and over here it also checks for file type. Um, essentially, file types uh, in this particular PHP script are checked by something called magic files or magic number. And this magic number is part of your file's header. Um, every file has a few header bytes that basically describe certain attributes and certain traits of the file. One of, the, one of which being the file type itself, which is denoted by magic number. And if you look at this code very quickly, um, it takes it takes a file, uploads it, um, separates extension separates extension from um, the actual file name, and sends it to the server in the upload directory over here. Now, at, at first glance, this might seem like a secure PHP code, but it really isn't, and we can see that because there was actually a very popular exploit written for this um, I think in 2020 yeah. so um, essentially there is a Python exploit that can utilize, utilize the fact that you can upload any PHP file to this web server and it will use, um, it will try to use that system call, that command exec function to execute basically any command you want. And in terms of security, we call this an unauthorized file upload and subsequently a remote code execution. If you can execute um, arbitrary code on a remote server, it is one of the most serious vulnerabilities you could have in the system. And what this can lead to is you can actually gain uh, complete access and complete domination over the system. Um, to go over this file a little bit, uh, ignoring the formatting. So the, the author of this particular exploit um, explained his, his process in a very simple way. Essentially what's happening is the file name is only being checked for one extension. That a uh, particular security parameter can be bypassed if you just have two extensions, two extensions in a file. So if you have image.php.png, uh, this script will say, okay, it has .png in the end, that's an allowed extension, um, this file is going to work. And secondly, um, the upload.php file validates files using that magic number that we talked about, but that magic number isn't all that secure either. Because what this exploit basically does is those are those are the magic bytes for PMG. It just appends it to the beginning of the file. Um, what's essentially happening here is a file is being uploaded uh, with a particular ID uh, to using the uh, upload.php script. A file is being uploaded to this web server and the content is basically manipulated by the person who wrote the exploit, and they're saying it's a PNG. Um, we're going to call it this PNG, and as you can see, it has a double extension here. It has the PHP magic bytes at the beginning, so it will still be validated by upload.php, and then we'll have this very nice shell one here called uh, echo shell exec get delivery. Essentially what this is doing is it's telling PHP to echo out back to the user whatever is the output of the shell exec function and the shell exec function is taking uh, the value of the telemetry parameter into it. So what we would have to, what someone would have to do to execute arbitrary files is define this function where for every uh, for every input that a user gives to this particular uh, to this particular program, 
it puts it in this element parameter and then subsequently uh, shell exec command is executed and you basically have command execution on that server. Just no conditions attached. Um, to, to demonstrate very quickly. So that, that IP address is essentially a test server that I ran. Uh, that's part of uh, a penetration testing suite for that box. And if I look at the API real quick. Right. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm basically following the syntax of this particular Python script. So if I don't do anything, it's going to give me uh, it's going to give me usage and an error. Um, and if I if I follow this, I guess, uh, instructions, hopefully I should get shared. Oh, why did I draw that out there? Sure. Uh, so does the behavior of the script depend on the uh, type of shell you're using? So like nowadays I know like Ubuntu has dash instead of bash and like there is VSH nowadays. So like, uh, uh, the behavior of the script doesn't really depend on the shell because shell exec as a PHP function in itself just takes whatever Sorry, it just takes whatever default shell that's running on the web server and uh, it's like a file. It takes the commands that you send, executes it with shell exec. Shell exec handles whatever shell is running on that end and there's, that just copies the output back to your server. Also, if the, the shell exec, when it runs, does it, uh, like I don't have experience with PHP, I run this in C, but like, does it uh, create a new chat process or is it like something different? Like, because I know there are like different ones. That's why it's kind of shell exec like just creates a socket and then it's just a file. I'm not, I'm not I'm making sense of the setup that it creates uh, a new chat process. Let me try and tell that again. Like, uh, Um, sorry about the delay. Essentially, um, sometimes I don't miss. Um, so this is basically using uh, a PHP shell exec command, as we discussed, and it gives us this uh, this neat little form over here. Um, so if I do something like, and by the prompt you can basically assume whether it's a Windows or a Linux system, um, C and backslash is um, usually clear indication that it's Windows. So if you run a div command, which uh, is the Windows equivalent of ls, you have that PHP file that we uh, that we fake, quote unquote. And what you can also do here is you can try and give other directories. So this is say C directory. Uh, you can run go by, and you have users like that. Essentially, this is part of uh, a penetration testing suite for attack bots, where the objective is to try and run exploits like this on a system and get a flag file. Um, typically, on a Windows system, the flag file is located on the user's desktop. So, if you want to go to users. That's, that's the flag file that challenges like this um, want you to sort of get to. Um, also, fair warning, this is a stateless shell, which means that every command that, that's executed, um, 
is sort of an entity in itself, so you can't change direct. You you can't have a demo change directly and expect a shell to run a page directly and work a page directly. Okay. Um, a simple solution to this is essentially you upload a binary called netcat, uh, which opens a, a socket, a, a listener, uh, listener socket, and you can upload this binary called netcat, and then you can connect to that new port that's now listening on this machine. Um, and you will have a page share access with the changing directories and all those nice features. Yeah. So, so basically, the S1 that you ran is running like an image of the user, or is it the actual user? You're running the Windows command on the installed machine. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, um, that's a good question. Essentially, this um, your PHP web server is mostly using XAMPP in this case. Uh, and XAM is running on the local user's account with the local user privileges. So if we can uh, if we can take advantage of the existing PHP configuration, which is the security vulnerability um, work, we can execute commands for the same privilege as the web server, and the web server has the same privilege as the local user. So we, we have user access on the system, uh, just not administrative access yet. Yeah. So just to recap, like what you tried to do here was like you ran a Python script on your local machine, right? Right. Which uh, basically executed some PHP uh, script or maybe commands on uh, yeah. right? yeah. the right? And basically you tried to run an exploit which would help you gain an access to a remote server which you wouldn't in a normal scenario, right? Right. right. Okay, so like this server is basically like it has to be protected, but just can exploit or be able to gain access to it without actually like moving the server, right? Right, right. So the vulnerability, there are two main vulnerabilities here. One, you're allowing anyone and everybody to upload files to this PHP server. Um, and then you're allowing them to pick it. Like essentially what the what the script here is doing is it's just sending get requests. Okay. Um, so it's reachable quote unquote. Um, and the second and more, most important vulnerability is the input sanitization that you have in the upload.php file is not enough. You can use magic number, you can use file extensions, but clearly it's still bypass one. So you can also send like pipes and pockets? Yeah, this this technically would call it. similar to the uh yeah. Okay. You can run you can run an entire binary on it. Um, in um, yeah, so when when I did when I did Active Machine, uh, I tend to write uh, write-ups and essentially what I'm doing here is I'm running a simple in this particular event, I'm running a simple Python server on my local machine and I'm using uh, Using this command execution that I have here to execute execute the command that reaches out to this Python web server that I hosted to retrieve the netcat binary, and then you can just set up a simple lister, and then you have uh, you have a two way a two way Python socket, and you have a full shell basically. It's analogous to SSH in this case. Um, and of course, once you do this, you can insert your SSH keys into the user system and you have persistent access. So I'm assuming these uh, like loopholes, like there are basically some sort of loopholes in the shell or maybe like in whatever like, uh, server that's running, right? Like whatever operating system or server is running. So like, like once these loopholes are discovered, it would be patched and then this is just available for access. Like this, right? Yeah, yeah. So this, this particular script is available for access. Exactly. Okay. That, that sort of serves as a nice segue to the next slide that I have is okay, like I, I showed you a PHP web shell exploit. PHP was used like 10 years ago on my skin, why am I showing you this now? The simple purpose of showing you this is uh, as a quick example because this is something that can be configured anywhere. Um, but the latest case of this happening was actually uh, December 21st, 26th last year, and it was the Famous or infamous uh, log4j exploit. Um, 
So other popular examples of software side vulnerabilities coming up are on, on screen. Essentially, every security vulnerability that comes to us, one way or the other, it's related to um, certain pieces of code being used in unintended ways. That's not to say that cybersecurity is a dynamic software engineer or anything. Um, but these uh, these these vulnerabilities basically are caused because of a disparity between um, a basic security posture understanding and a software engineering mindset, which is the entire part of you know trying to bridge those two bridge those two things together because they're not really mutually exclusive. Um, so with the with the log4j uh, exploit, for example, or the vulnerability, um, this is arguably the biggest vulnerability in the existence of computer science. Um, Log4j uh, vulnerability was found in 2020, uh, public disclosure around 2nd or 3rd week of December, and had, it had a severity metric, uh, metric of 10 uh, out of 10. No vulnerability prior to this has achieved a CDSS or severity score of perfect 10. Um, the reason it was so is because of the wide scale impact that this vulnerability had. Log4j is basically a popular logging library uh, in Java. And the, the timeline is as such that in 2013, um, it's, I think it's, yeah, it's an open source project. Um, in, in 2013, someone requested the, the functionality of adding a feature called lookups, where in, in, in a Java program, if you use the logging library and you type something like, percent m uh, n home uh, might be syntactically a little bit inaccurate but the idea is that if you type code like this what it's going to do is it's going to replace this string with the out, with the value of your home environment variable on your particular system and this functionality was suggested in 2013 um, in about 2016 uh, eventually when this functionality was like further developed, it allowed for JNDI lookups. JNDI is basically thought of just fancy Java objects uh, for the sake of simplicity. And if you can parse an entire Java object and look up an entire Java object, um, it allows you to remotely access and execute code. Because a Java object, you know, in, among many other things, can also represent code. Um, and due to, due to the feature tracking not being done properly, multiple developers working on the same thing simultaneously, uh, even though in 2016 security researchers came up and said that if you look up a JNDI object in the same format, it could potentially be hazardous, uh, no one really paid attention. So from 2016, when this sort of thought was first spawned, to 2021, for five years, um, a lot of security engineers and software engineers online just ignored this, uh, this possibility. And contrary to popular belief, this exploit was not found um, in Minecraft. A lot of people have heard that and believe that. It was found by someone in the Alibaba Kamal security team. And essentially, what, uh, what the exploit came to be is you can look up anything using a GNDI lookup. You can also, um, you know, send RDP code there and have it run as soon as you trigger the um, Other other popular examples are cross-site scripting and SQL injections. Essentially, when you have an input field in a web application, um, if you inject JavaScript code into it and you hit submit, and then JavaScript code runs, um, that's cross-site scripting. If, uh, whereas if you inject like SQL code in it and you end your SQL code with a dash dash that basically comments out the rest of the code, um, you can potentially get access to an entire database like that. Um, both of these vulnerabilities, uh, most modern browsers such as Chrome handle on their end. Um, Chrome in particular is completely invulnerable to cross site scripting, um, so no chance. But these these injections are still uh, these injections are still extremely popular on other browsers, 
websites, things like that. Um, and the last example I wanted to show you guys was something called VSMTP. Um, in version 2.3.4 of this uh, this vulnerability, um, sorry, this service, MTP basically is file transfer protocol, and you know, as the name explains, it allows you to transfer files from one client to the other. But what this uh, what this particular version it actually had a bad go because if you look at this code over here, uh, it's very to see. Um, essentially, it checks whether um, any two adjacent characters in your input string are those two hexadecimal characters, and that is that basically translates to a smiley face in ASCII. Um, if that's entered, if that if that's entered, it triggers a function called sysutil extra, and this function basically opens a new socket on the port um, sixty two hundred and listens for any incoming connections that may come. It's a deliberate backdoor. Um, so if someone say wanted to exploit it, they could simply uh, they could simply in the username of your FTP connection, in the username if you enter a smiling face, it will automatically trigger uh, a new open port on the system on port 6200 and you can connect to it with root privileges, no authentication required. Um, and this dominated the market for quite some time. To take more time with the word Professor Michael James, you build a TP server and plant and plant and plant and plant. Yeah, uh, it's in my class, right? Um, but cool, so problems aside, how do we, how do we fix things like this? Essentially, there's no one fix to it. The idea is, Design software by managing expectations of users as well, and then add unexpected features behind an opt-in method to sort of translate this into an example. Um, if you're using a Linux system, you don't want to give every user pseudo privileges. You know, you might trust them, but even if they mistype something, um, it can lead to a lot of unnecessary things happening on the system. And the last thing is design for simplicity. Don't abstract that necessarily. And this was, I actually pulled this code off a YouTube video explaining log 4 Because when you track log 4 code, um, this thing, this lookup that I just showed, does nothing but runs system.env and then the pure variable name in Java. Instead of performing a lookup in your print statement, a user could have literally just written system.n, whatever we did before. But it was abstracted for reasons that it was abstracted to like make it look nice and have, have this unified interface to, to the login directory. Um, so what are we talking about? Um, okay, so to the good stuff. So what kind of job exists in this space? Essentially, um, you're broadly looking at three categories of jobs, names and particular um, company particulars can vary. Uh, security engineering, product security, and security analysts are the three broad umbrella terms which um, you might come across when you uh, when you look for roles like this. Uh, security engineering is typically what uh, I focus in, and it involves in everything from building of automation. Uh, to managing threat detection, uh, to even performing offensive security exercises like hacking the company and you know, seeing what vulnerabilities it has. Product security is a field that uh, one of our friends does uh, at, at Facebook, where every every operating system, every uh, you know good chunk of code is tested for vulnerabilities, uh, like I just showed you in the presentation. It's tested whether um, if you're receiving a password from a user, you don't want to store that memory because you know what if someone would just look at the stack. Um, so things like that. And security analysts is more of a broad umbrella term, um, even more so than the first two, where you can do everything from network monitoring to system logging to um, again threat detection and things like that. So the recruitment process. 
this is really similar to some typical software engineering or CS jobs, where you have you have your coding interviews typically involves algorithms and data structures. Um, usually, you never go to a deep code hard question, like all basically never. But sometimes you can get asked like a deep code medium level question. Um, you have scripting interviews which are unique to this domain of jobs where you will get you get a problem and you are asked to uh, solve it or just explain your thought process that really depends on the company. Um, so one one possible example could be okay, let's say let's say you have let's say you have an IP address, how do you figure out which subnet that IP address is to? In a way it's a it's a string manipulation and scripting problem. And then another example would be, um, can you code popular cryptographic uh, algorithms like a Caesar cipher, where you basically shift the character by a set number of uh, by a set number of positions. So if your shift is one, A will become B, B will become C, so on and so forth. Uh, you also have some system design questions, um, but these are not too much in depth. They, they basically want to gauge your understanding of how uh, of how you can build a system and integrate it within their infrastructure in particular. And you also get some domain related questions like when you actually understand. The, this most common question is how does the internet work? And ideally you would be able to explain it in um, in terminology of switches and routers. Um, other questions revolve around if you set up a web server, how do you secure it? Step one, you use PHP. Um, and what else? Yeah, like, how do you, if you install Wi Fi on a system, how do you secure it? So, there are some other resources. Um, firstly, there's a course at Brexit that you can take about this, and it's led by Professor uh, Spiros Matwaris. And it's called CS377. Um, in the course, you go over security binaries, uh, some popular malware exploits, things like that. Um, there's also Drexel like Cyberdragons, and I don't mean to pull you guys away from this stuff. Um, happens at a completely different case, uh, Tuesday and Thursdays. But this is Drexel's uh, cybersecurity and technical hacking club, where we go over all things security, some things software related engineering. And uh, prepare you for interviews, competitions, whatever. Um, and thirdly, there's uh, one of my favorite security channels on YouTube, which is called Live Overflow. It's actually in this video that I watched before, like explaining the algorithm to you guys. Um, but yeah, Live Overflow is basically a security researcher based in Germany, and he does a lot of um, CS cybersecurity in session topics. Um, so this So I got one. What would be your favorite recruitment question if you were to recruit? Okay, that's that's pretty. Um, okay, I would I would look at your resume, see if you've listed any fancy words uh, or tools. Um, a lot of people like to use tools like Nmap or or frameworks like Docker and sort of things like that. And I would probably uh, probably will you down for that. In, in a recent interview I had um, with TikTok, so I have a, I have a RSI coding project on my resume. And in, in my interview with TikTok, the um, interview asked me, okay, I see you have RSA, this RSA project on your GitHub. Um, explain the entire project. So, whatever you have on your resume, try to be as best. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, for someone in a more like SE or application development background, what kind of tools or how would you lead them into going into cybersecurity or systems integration and stuff like that? Or even that field that's, that's a great question. Um, Essentially, for uh, someone with a coding background that wants to sort of explore the field of security, um, there is no one roadmap to 
pretty entirely of security. You can start wherever, wherever you feel most comfortable. Broadly, the domains um, are web security and networks, which involves uh, you know how packets are transmitted across networks, how how switches and routers are configured, and uh, again how, how websites are configured, browsers are configured, things like that. There's operating systems, which revolves around uh, things like setting IP scripts, um, memory needs, binary exploitations, things like that. And then you have the conventional route of um, you know, just ethical hacking and things like that. If you want to get into ethical hacking, um, there are a few resources I can point you towards. Just, um, just see me after the thing. Um, I'll give you a few websites. Uh, for the other two domains, there's a ton of online resources. One of the most popular resources that I use apart from YouTube is called cyberly.it. Uh, again, I'll, I'll share the link um, after the talk and I'll add it after the session. So, yeah, wow. so my question was on a similar note. So, like, for someone who is a software engineer, like, let's say, developing a web app, what are the most like we don't, we're not about like hacking ultimately. What are the most standard practices to make sure that like no open codes and things like that? Like, is right. there any tools for that? The, the easiest thing you can do is just uh, be conscious about it. And what I mean by that is um, today we, we have classes on human centered design and UI UX design, for example. And they teach us to be more conscious about you know where we place a button, what kind of fonts and colors we use. So it's, so things are more intuitive to the user. I would say try and use a similar thought process while you're coding web apps or while you're coding software to try and see that, okay, if, if I was a hacker, um, let's say let's say your storing password is memory. And you can think about it in the sense that do I really want this to be stored in memory unencrypted where someone could just you know take advantage of the stack and, and try and gain something? That makes sense. Yeah, I've been in the software security class with Professor Spiro, I took it last year, and it's actually very useful because um, they alternate between like lectures on one week and then the other week actually like implement the attack on like what they say. So it's a really good class, I highly recommend it. I hope I don't get to And it's start and see. Um, and the attacks that they teach are really uh, useful. And yeah. 